All right, guys, so the second half of this, I'm going to focus on um, giving you an overview of kind of contemporary art and postmodernism and sort of doing this um, as quickly as humanly possible so that um, you guys aren't bombarded by too many works of art before the final exam. So when we have sort of moved here out of talking about modernism and into minimalism and into performance art and conceptual art, um, we've seen sort of the change from modernism to contemporary art. And these are some sort of differences between those, um, just some sort of key points to think about. So new types of art, we have collage, kinetic art, performance art, land art. We've been seeing this over the last couple of weeks. We have the use of new materials, again, um, ready-mades, found objects, um, etc. You can sort of get an idea of how that works into new types of art. Um, expressive use of color, uh, we're explaining color in a major way, um, etc. And new techniques, new ways of using new and old materials. So again, they all sort of um, have to do with materials um, and utilizing them in different ways. There's a sociologist, Nathalie Hynek, uh, draws a distinction between modern and contemporary art, describing them as different paradigms which partially overlap historically. Modern art challenges the conventions of representation, while contemporary art challenges the very notion of an artwork. So when we start talking about what postmodernism is, this is where we sort of are right now historically, in that, yes, of course, we're in contemporary art, but we often also cause it, call it postmodernism. And it became a catch-all term to describe trends in visual culture. And it's brought in by this idea of post-industrial society, where we're in a capitalist um, society now that's advanced, uh, based on information processing, on globalization, um, on the use of technology. So around the 1970s, impulses surrounding modern art have exhausted themselves. You have that this potential feeling that all rules have been broken. We kind of talked about these ideas at the beginning of the semester. Um, everything is a norm breaker. The media encourages this by treating each other, um, each new consumer product as a revolution and rule breaking as the norm. We saw this, I showed you that Burger King commercial where um, even advertisement is using this idea of a norm or rule breaker as sort of part of a trend. And modern artists are no longer controversial, right? Pablo Picasso, Vincent van Gogh are kind of the most desired pieces of art at auction. So modern artists are not considered revolutionary, or not necessarily not revolutionary, but not controversial, not sort of having love-hate relationships with them. They're loved, people are obsessing over them, paying millions of dollars of them. Um, they're very cool and trendy now. So postmodernism is kind of a weird term because it seems to come from some relationship with the idea of modernism itself. It Initially, it's sort of implying an opposition to some of the tenets of modernism, including modernist confidence in social and technological progress, faith in history unfolds in a rational and linear direction, and belief in individual self-determination. So there are some scholars um, like Jurgen Habermas um, that thinks that postmodernism, so the sort of contemporary world that we're in right now, is just another section of the whole of modernism. So Habermas thinks that today's contemporary society is just a section of modernism. However, I would think that that is sort of simplistic. I would say that once you move out of modernism, we're not in modernism anymore. We're in contemporary art and we're just calling it postmodernism because it's after modernism um, and sort of plays against all of those constructs. So, verse, um, for example, Jean Francois Lautard said, "It isn't simplified. Um, you can't be simplifying this it this much." Post, post, oh my goodness, postmodernism for Lautard simply admits the seemingly obvious points of social or even scientific fact may have no more claim to absolute truth than do forthrightly fictional narratives like novels or soap operas. So. Um, we may be thinking about these ideas of modernism and what happened before us, but we're really sort of going against all of these ideas and rethinking them completely. So you can see that in some of the performance art and minimalism and concept and process art that we've been seeing. And you can see how different that art is from the modernist period and how much we're sort of moving away from that 
um, art historically that it doesn't really feel like modernism at all. It feels completely different. So um, I would think about postmodernism slash contemporary art as a completely different um, artistic movement. Um, thinking about forms of culture are hybrid, eclectic, and heterogeneous rather than pure and easily defined and contained. So postmodernists believe we are all prisoners to some degree of identities constructed for us by artistic and popular media, among other cultural influences. Also, the art world is becoming increasingly more artificial because secondhand images that are filtered through television, film, and other media now substitute for direct experiences and exert powerful influence on how we perceive and understand the world. Like my screen is dark. Um, and then Simulcra uh, by Jean Baudrillard, no longer able to distinguish between model and copy, lost sense of reality, in that um, the production of artwork seems sort of less unique in a lot of ways because we are so um, consumed by cultural images and um, photography and film that like um, things seem to relate to each other so complexly. Also a big tenet of postmodernism is art implied a dissatisfaction with the narrow confines of modernism, which apparently prompted the accomplishments of white male artists of European descent at the expense of engaging political and social concerns and now majority and female artists. Postmodern postmodernism um, as an opposite to modernism um, which engages with these things, um, encouraged overtly polemic practices and ironic distance from conventions of the past. AKA, we have that, um, like we're going to look at the Gorilla Girls today, that artists um, that are not black, that are, are not black, that are not white and male are not being represented are historically in museums. And you can tell that because as we've looked at modernism, you have seen that even though we talk about a, a female artist here and a black artist here and an Asian artist here, they are not the majority or even a big portion, right? Because they're being um, put below all of these quote unquote sort of male geniuses of like Jackson Pollock, right? Jackson Pollock is above Lee Krasner. Um, and I've, so I've hopefully sort of been pointing these things out to you as we've moved through this semester so that you're starting to get a sense of how then um, people are like, this is ridiculous. You can't be just looking at one point of view in art, right? That's sort of not the point. So when we move into contemporary art, this idea of postmodernism, um, people are inspired by their own internal and external experiences. Contemporary art has no single point of view or objective, great diversity of perspectives, pluralistic and globalized society where innovation can happen anywhere. And we have pluralism, many styles and ideas coexisting. Uh, um, this brings back old styles and mediums. Within this, postmodernists question one of the modernist basic notions of whether or not an individual can create something original, again, because of cultural saturation in films, in videos, um, in music, etc. So some of the important themes, uh, some of them are which I will address today, identity, body, technology, globalization, migration, society, culture, memory, passage of time, and artistic critique of sociopolitical institutions, aka institutional critique. So I know that this kind of seems like a lot, but what sort of the large issue with people that people come to with trying to understand and think about contemporary art is that we're in it right now, right? So even though the 1970s to now is such, right, that's 50 years of time that you have to account for, um, we are still in contemporary art. And so it's so hard to look from the outside into them because up to this point we are looking at artistic periods that have passed they're not currently happening and so it seems sort of easy to identify something once you look at it um, but contemporary art is so much more complicated than that because we're in it right now we're feeling it we're understanding it in the present and so um, we don't know how the art artistic movements are going to develop and divide and if that's even possible anymore um, with the so much social awareness of like who we are as individuals, right? So like it's kind of uh, complex for contemporary scholars and art historians to kind of understand where we're going from here because we're in it and we're living it day by day. So I hope that kind of makes sense. We're writing art history as it's happening right now. I think I feel like I just went on a rant. 
So you can think about how contemporary artists are rethinking ideas like rethinking material in painting. So when you sort of go back to using um, some of these sort of more, more traditional mediums, you'll see sort of artists taking these ideas and rethinking the material. So I kind of want to think about that in painting as an example, just in case that doesn't totally make sense to you. So when you take a medium and you want to rethink it, rethink how painting has been used historically, you have sort of a self-consciousness towards the medium. It was being taken for granted that the properties of painting, formal or political, had been exposed, began generating imagery by using their old tools of realism in a new context of postmodernism. So I'm going to give you here two examples of how artists are rethinking painting outside of the modernist period. John Curran is one of those artists. He is very interesting. He thinks about um, his paintings where his figures are purely artificial in the contemporary mind, dressed as if they were mimetic representations of the real and emphasis, emphasizing sort of weird, um, exaggerated fantasies of middle-class white America. Um, a lot of his works are intensely sexualized. I'm going to show you them here next. Um, this painting I just find to be hilarious. I don't know why it like relates so much to like weird Snapchat, Instagram faces, right? Like, um, this is me when I Snapchat my crush versus like, this is when I Snapchat my best friends. I don't, that's, I don't know why that's what comes to my mind. Um, I don't know. But um, what John Curran does, and he's a very sort of interesting and controversial artist, is that he paints these images of women. And he's very much sort of thinking about um, the male view and white male America and sort of this sort of over-sexualization of figures. So this is The Cripple from 1997, and he gives it this sort of deliberately provocative title from an image that is suggestive, right? She's clearly sort of sexual, kind of pinup girl, but here she has a cane, and so he's kind of implying that she's sort of a crippled figure um, in some capacity. And so you're taking this um, image and making her kind of this disturbing young waif um, for a, the male imagination, right? So you take this cripple, but ooh, you sexualize her, and she's fun, and she's flirty, and you want to have sex with her. And um, he's often creating women of figures of women with like huge breasts and um, sort of coddling helpless men. So you can go ahead and look at John Curran's work and go to get a sense that he's playing with some of these constructs of male fantasy in painting that have been sort of, you can sort of think about it historically, right? All these ways that men paint women um, as sort of sexual objects, as representations of metaphors for female sexuality, and John Curran is playing with that in his paintings. And has been sort of like rethought in like even photography today, like Julianne Moore in this Peter Limburg series where she like stood as artistic paintings. But the question that I mean comes about John Curran's work when he's addressing this, this sort of historic idea of females represented in painting as a medium is he actually a misogynist, right? Um, and people have asked him. Um, Disgust as representing the masochism of hyperbolic male fantasy, Curran defends himself against charges of misogyny by asserting that, though he uses the tools of realism, the subject of painting is always the artist, never the object that he or she paints. Now, um, that doesn't seem like a legitimate um, excuse away of what he's doing. He needs to be more direct because what it comes off as, and this is sort of a, a large conversation in contemporary art, is that you are trying to think complexly about think complexly about misogynistic ways that women are represented by representing women misogynistically. And is that then, as a white man that John Curran is, and continuing to represent women very sexually, you're, are you just feeding into that fantasy? Um, so you can think about him and think about whether or not you agree or disagree. I tend to say, mm, John Curran, you seem like you play it. I don't know. So you can think about this also with Lisa Yuskavage. So she's very much taking the idea of painting as well and rethinking it um, in a very sort of different way. So this is a sort of a female point of view versus Curran. You have the heightening irony of realism by representing illogical figures with logical um, devices of illusionism. 
um, using exaggerated female anatomies and also thinking about sort of soft colors. She's drawing people inwards with her violets and pinks and blues that dominate the scenes. Her works are very erotic and self-absorbed. You can see in sort of these two paintings, but she's doing it a little differently than um, John Curran because they don't necessarily seem as objectified. It's more of kind of an intimate view. Um, and also she's a woman, and so then does she get away with playing with some of these ideas more? So for example, this is Honeymoon, in which you have, she's very much in her work, she's borrowing from the visual language of erotic fantasy, where commercial pornography has become a big part of the mainstream, and playing with suggestive figures, but it's also very sort of sensuous, um, where like you have the surface of the flesh and the nightgown with the view of the mountains, feels sort of... Um, very like very much like a fantasy or a dream and creates a work that flirts with the insipid um, but saved by the flagrant expression of both cliche and anatomy as well as creative painterly technique so is she playing into objectification or is she more interested um, in playing with some of these um, constructs in a sort of flirty and feminine way um, so you can sort of think about Curran and Yuskavage as foils because maybe she is indeed critiquing commercial pornography by sharply manipulating its old visual conventions, testifies to the persistence of irony in contemporary art, or is she playing into these sort of negative constructs um, of female objectification just as much as Curran is? I'm going to have us dive into the themes now um, after we've looked at some examples here. So we're going to divide up these contemporary works by themes. So we're going to look at technology, globalization, public funding for art, commercialization as well as appropriation, identity, the body, memory, and science. Now obviously there are a lot more works and a lot more themes, but I'm trying to keep it sort of condensed, um, even though this seems like a lot within itself. So we are going to look at some of these works here. So technology is obviously a big part of contemporary society, and obviously you can see that artists would play with those things and play with the constructs of what social media um, and technology means to us as individuals. New technologies, new, new technologies are offering different ways of conceptualizing, producing, and showing visual art. Established art forms are under scrutiny and revision. Many artists playing with many different types of media. So again, um, this type of material in art is not available to people necessarily in modernism. So you have more film, video, audio, installation, performance, text, computers, phones, printers, etc. Artists are also rethinking how our lives are more dependent on technology, smartphones, and social media, and that how that then affects their art. Some artists say that um, it's hard to compete with um, technology and social media in art, in galleries, because there's so much image saturation already. I don't teach a lot of new media uh, and net art because um, it sort of becomes dated in a lot of ways, um, which is quite sad because 93 was not really that long ago. But um, I'm going to give you here two examples of net art and how we see sort of net art coming into play. So this is Jody.org, and what we see with sort of early net art is that you have, in the mid-1990s, personal computers um, are starting to become um, used in sort of general homes. People are having more um, access to these things, like CD-ROMs and the web. Yes, using word like CD-ROMs <laughs> dates this work. Um, but um, there's so many different ways that media is being used, and so you'll have artists who are kind of using data techniques in their ready-made and thinking about technology and visual language of the web and what that kind of means. So go ahead and check, check out Jody.org um, as well as the next work um, as sort of examples of net art because they're so weird. So for example, with Jody.org, you sort of click anywhere and sort of break down into sort of the constructs of what um, this website takes you to and you can sort of click anywhere and it takes you to different parts of the images um, and ideas Ooh. maybe you guys are bored enough to play with this kind of stuff Ooh, have i run out of places to click <gasps> oh 
But anyway, it's really not that exciting. I don't know why I'm acting crazy. Um, or for example, Mark Napier, who's talking about kind of deconstruction of media and composition and trying to use collage in media. His work is even crazy because like you can see right away how much it's dated when you just even click into the shredder. Um, so basically what this website is, is that you can put any website um, into here and it will mix it. So let's say that I wanna do Google um, images of John Curran's work. Do, 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 do. Where did my shredder go? There you are. And then shred it. Oh. And then you can click through and um, sort of collage it further. Maybe this one isn't as fun, um, but you guys can give it a shot. Sometimes I like to collage jody.org because somehow that seems funny um, in itself. There are a lot of different other just playing with technology as well. Um, Sai Kuo Chang is one of them in his Inopportune Stage 1 in 2004. He's a very famous and well-known Chinese, Chinese artist and plays a lot with installation and gunpowder and sort of all these new sort of materials in contemporary art. Um, in this work, he plays sort of nine um, different identical Tauruses, AKA white cars, um, suspended midair to appear as though the cars are flipping. A lot of his work has to do with this kind of release of energy and creation of new possibilities through destruction um, and the sort of beauty in destruction and chaos. Um, so in something like a car accident, thinking about um, the sort of beauty that could be in that moment, this, this yin and yang of beauty and destruction and using these sort of colored tubes to kind of radiate that out this is another version um i've had some students say that it's kind of like thinking about um maybe about texting and texting and car accidents um, or those sort of things as well i do have a link to a video about this work um, if you're interested Another work by him, Color Mushroom Cloud from 2017, um, has to do with sort of nuclear warfare. We've kind of talked about this in World War II. Um, he creates a multicolor mushroom cloud shot over the sky at the former site of Chicago, um, where they created the, the world's first artificial nuclear reactor at the University of Chicago, where they were able to sort of detonate um, nuclear bombs in sort of a safe space. And so, he did this and sort of ushered in the new atomic age at the exact time um, that the they did originally at 325 p.m. And so by using sort of pyrotechnics and gunpowder, he created this really interesting work um, that he exploded as sort of part um, of memorializing this idea of nuclear warfare, but also um, rethinking about the destruction and pain that that has caused sort of historically. And of course, it's kind of really gorgeous and really interesting. Um, this Instagram video is like my favorite image of it because um, it is so sort of intensely, um, it ca really captures it really well. So I'm going to give you this video here, very short. So I'll have that link in the links as well for you to watch. Um, but just playing with this idea um, of nuclear warfare and how much sort of war and weaponry has played a big part in society right now um, in sort of um, warfare outside of the United States. A lot of his work kind of connects with this next theme we're going to talk about, um, which is globalization and technology. Um, so this is Opportune Stage 2, in which he has nine realistic tigers. Um, they are not real. Um, each one of them pierced with 100 arrows, referencing 13th century Chinese stories about bravery, in which a man named Wu Song rescued a village by slaying an entire 
um, slaying a man-eating tiger. And so this complex relationship, again, between man and his environment, that very much, again, has to do with technology, right, and the way that we interact with our contemporary environment in sort of a techno technological way and sort of the havoc that mankind causes through violence and through war. Similarly to Head On, which I think is um, also a very powerful work of his, a lot of his work seems very disparate, but kind of all comes together in sort of this same interesting idea of beauty and destruction. Um, this work has 99 wolves who soar in unison towards a transparent barrier and crash violently into it. And then they get back up and run to the end of line to do it again. Um, this is another installation of it here. Um, this powerful representation of humanity's cyclical history of launching headlong into self-destructive conflicts. Um, and also the sort of eradication and threat to the wolf population as sort of another um, part of the definition of this work. So thinking about um, how humanity sort of treats the environment in a destructive but beautiful way as well. Globalization is another big part of sort of the art world and our economy today. Um, you start to see sort of massive gaps in who is represented in the global in global art and who isn't. So you can think about how not only does global art sort of let us be more connected to one another, and um, that is also because of technology, but also you start to see who is actually represented in media more than others. Um, oops, I'm sorry. For example, not every person everywhere has access to computers and the internet, and thus technologies reinforce privilege and power for those who are well connected to the flow of information. One could argue that globalization is dehumanizing people and leveling our differences because it is bringing the same consumer products, images, and information to everyone all over the world. Um, even though there's sort of not universi universality, um, you do have people who are connected more by globalization and technology, and then people who um, are still separated from those privileges. Um, in this globalization is where I discussed Ai Weiwei. Um, I have deleted it for, since we talked about him in class, um, so I'm just going to keep it out of it. So uh, I'm going to move on to the next topic. Public funding for arts is another sort of controversial topic that um, has come under fire sort of recently um, in the art community um, in this sort of contemporary time period that we're in. So as I sort of briefly mentioned with like street art and land art that I talked about um, during that week, the U.S. has definitely been mourning deaths from AIDS up to this time. But there are also sort of conservative voices trying to stop particular shows um, and from exhibitions of art from taking place. Um, if we feel like we haven't seen this before, right, like impressionism, degenerate art, right, like thinking about the way that people try to um, shut down free speech in some capacity. So as I talked about, you have a lot of famous artists dealing with AIDS and HIV. Um, I'm not going to talk about this a lot again, um, even though I wish that we could. Uh, but really, if you're interested to sort of go and investigate some of the artists that are dealing with some of these ideas at the time, um, like Felix Gonzalez Torres with his entitled portrait of Ross in LA, um, and how it's um, this work you may be familiar with because it's at the Chicago Art Institute, but you can take a piece of candy and it represents um, his partner, Ross Laycock, who died of AIDS and how he slowly went from 175 pounds um, and slowly deteriorated. So um, the connection with the people um, with his life. Um, so if you're interested in sort of investigating these those works, definitely give them a look. But as sort of the, the U.S. was suffering from these issues as well, you had large figures in politics trying to cut funding for art. Um, once in power, conservative legislators began a concerted assault on government funding of art containing sexual or otherwise challenging content. Um, the National Endowment for Arts, or NEA, came under scrutiny and was cut back. To what extent should artwork be judged by its social rather than aesthetic merit? Some people thought it would allow for more freedom, while others thought it would start an issue with corporate greed. And we're going to see how both sides were right. And we're going to look at an example um, of this in the Sensation ex exhibition, so um, which was a famous exhibition that travels from 97 to 2000 and put on by Charles Saatchi.
I did want to mention this other artist um, because you have a lot of different artists who are working um, in the artistic field that a lot of conservative artists, artists conservative people, um, don't necessarily want on display. So you can think about like Robert Maplethorpe um, in that group. He's a very famous photographer at this time. Um, he starts releasing these really gorgeous um, photographs that people sort of want to um, not see in museums. And so you have some protests going on of his work. So for example, in this series in particular, um, he is photographing BDSM culture of gay men in New York City, um, in leather culture, and sort of um, over-sexualized images and poses. And so this type of work starts to really shock people. And so you have these moments where you think that the government shouldn't be involved, you think there shouldn't be public funding of art, and so um, these sorts of controversies start to arise. So the Sensation exhibit is really such a good example of that. It was this traveling exhibit, it moved um, from sort of Berlin to New York City, and it was put on by Charles Saatchi, who was a very famous um, and powerful figure outside of the artistic world, but he wanted to display his 90 works of art. And um, he was trying to promote the YBA, which were this large group of young British artists at the time who were displaying controversial objects. He had bought a bunch of their work and wanted to display them together. And so he creates this large traveling exhibit. Now, in some ways, he created this exhibit and wanted to show it off um, to show these objects as one would. However, he also had sort of commercial um, stake in that if these works were displayed, they would become worth more, that people would see them, that they would sort of bring up controversy, bring up news. Um, and so that definitely became a part of um, commercial gain for him. So what ended up happening was it became this really, it became a sensation uh -huh, uh -huh, um, that people thought um, the works were very sexual, very um, not suitable for sort of the general public. And so um, as people sort of went in droves to see this work, they started to put up warnings, like there will be works on displays in the sensation exhibit, which some people may find distasteful. Parents should exercise, exercise their judgment in bringing their children to the exhibition. One gallery will not be open to those under the age of 18. And what started to happen was that politicians and figures started to protest this work being brought to the United States and that the Brooklyn Museum in New York City, New York, um, was displaying this work. So ironically enough, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani was mayor at the time. He called this work sick stuff and threatened to withdraw the annual $7 million City Hall grant from the Brooklyn Museum, saying you don't have the right to government subsidy for desecrating somebody else's religion. So not only were these works sort of highly sexual, um, people also thought that they were desecrating sort of the Catholic religion, like Giuliani. And so you had this massive protest about um, free speech and about whether or not the government should fund art institutions and not have a say of what goes in in them at all, um, because that's breaking free speech, but then should they be funding art at all? And so you had protests going on in New York at the time um, on both sides. So what did end up happening was there was a um, sort of lawsuit between Brooklyn, try, the Brooklyn Museum trying to make sure that they would keep their grant to display this art. And they did end up, in fact, winning and they were able to display this work. So I will show you um, that work here. But um, Floyd Abrams is someone who fought against this, against Michael Hess and against all these different figures. Um, in the government saying, um, the mayor is saying, in effect, if there is a book in the library that we fund, I can take it out if it's offensive. That is profoundly dangerous, profoundly dangerous, and that's why we have to go to court. And so they won um, to keep these works on display as a part of um, religious freedom and um, freedom of speech. So I'm going to show you a couple of the controversial works from this ex exhibition. And these artists have become sort of insanely famous, Damien Hirst being someone in this exhibition um, from this work, and Saatchi, of course, becoming insanely rich. Um, so Andre Serrano's Piss Christ is one of them from 1989. He um, 
placed a crucifix in a vial of his own urine and photographed it. Um, he is, he does say that he is religious himself and he thinks about different images and ideas um, merged in milk and blood and urine. He doesn't think it's denouncing, um, but thinking about sort of the raw act of crucifixion and the way that bodily fluids would have been involved. Um, but people have again said that this is a desecration of Christ's symbols and Christ's figures. Um, and I'm going to show you sort of each one of a lot of these works have been um, vandalized in some capacity. So here you have someone um, breaking this work um, and shattering the frame that it's in. You also have some very famous works of art by Damien Hirst that were on view. So the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living from 1991, um, in which a tiger shark is held in formaldehyde. Um, these works are quite controversial in that um, not only is Damien Hirst um, producing these large scale works um, that cost a lot of money to produce, that um, he doesn't have sort of an artistic hand in it, that he's doing animal cruelty. This tiger did have to be, the tiger shark did have to be replaced at some point because he didn't um, put it in formaldehyde correctly and so it deteriorated. Um, so thinking about um, sort of the constructs of the art making at this time with Damien Hirst in that he's using animals in formaldehyde like scientific experiments as part of his work and whether or not that's sort of morally correct um, or that um, he's creating works like a thousand years in which he places a cow head in this um, cube uh, sculpture which flies come and eat the head um, of the cow. So you have that maggots are released and they metamorphize into flies um, that then burn in the light. And so you, you sort of go by hour after hour after hour watching the um, ways that flies are, flies are eating this animal um, so that they have this kind of freedom in this cage but also um, are held captive. So they're really weird um, works but sort of uh, flung Damien Hurst into um, fame and this work was um, supposedly sold for about 12 million dollars to someone and it deteriorated in 2006 so um, lasted about 15 years or so. You also have Mark Quinn's work being displayed here. This is his self-portrait made um, out of his own blood. He has taken 10 pints of his own blood um, and made an image of himself um, in a cast and he's had to do this and then freeze it so that the blood stays at sort of this stable um, form and needs to be the, then like plugged in and frozen um, in the gallery space so it stays. Um, but he was making these works when he was an alcoholic and so he was commenting on these notions of dependency because this work can't survive um, without being frozen and taken care of as he can't survive without sort of alcohol and his own vices. And he sort of remade this work over and over after years, but it's really sort of grotesque to think about him pumping his blood out and then creating a sculpture out of it. And he's done this um, several times. There are, of course, other works that play with sort of construct constructs of religion that really sort of terrorize people. This is Chris Ophelia's The Holy Virgin Mary from 1996, um, in which he depicts a black Madonna adorned with elephant dung, um, as seen here. Um, she's covered and cut out with images of female genitalia from pornographic magazines. So if you see these little butts and vaginas, um, as well as shimmering orange resin that recalls golden leaf of religious icons. Um, so he's playing with these constructs. He's an African artist and um, trying to evoke some sort of sense of cultural heritage and connection with being um, proud and black and sexual and creating this sort of hip hop version of the Virgin Mary. Um, that connects with kind of Madonna being a sexual figure um, and sort of his own interpretation of her. But as you can imagine, people sort of thought um, that this was inherently sexual, that it was desecrating the image of the Madonna. And so this work was vandalized as well um, by the sort of general public. 
There are other works that deal with sort of different themes. This is Myra by Marcus Harvey from 1995 in the depiction of a child killer, Myra Hindley, um, and it was made out of tiny children's handprints, um, which I'll show you here in a minute. Um, her and Ian Bradley killed at least five children, and both of them did die in prison. Um, but it was done with all of these tiny handprints um, to reflect this image here, um, which is from a police lineup. So you can see them here. And he, they did this with a doll's hand, but really to kind of reflect on um, the brutality and the way that this woman sort of controlled um, children and people's lives at the time um, and sort of her sort of um, cynic personality. But this work was controversial because um, there was a group called Mothers Against Murder and Aggression and they were trying to protect the mothers of these victims um, and tried to um, destroy this painting as well. But, um, and even Hinley, the woman who is depicted here, thought it should be taken down as well. Um, but um, Marcus Harvey continued to have it displayed um, and sold. Other works deal with sexuality, like Tracy Amin's. I haven't included a lot of the works from this exhibition, but you can definitely take a look, um, just for time reasons. I, we can't look at all of them. Um, but this is her work, Everyone I've Ever Slept With, from 93 to 95, in which she, um, inside of a tent, um, sewed every name of in each individual she slept with, about 102 names, um, having to do with being open about her sexuality and her life and about recording it. Um, not all of these individuals she had sex with, but they can also be just people she slept with, um, like in her bed or near her. So it doesn't have to be inherently sexual. Um, but this work was destroyed in 2004 in a fire and she never recreated it. So it's kind of tragic. It doesn't exist anymore. But like I said, a lot of this exhibition not only came under controversy because of how crazy um, controversial these works were individually, but also how Charles Saatchi was kind of manipulating the SIP system. This is a work by the Gorilla Girls. Um, how much do art collectors have to pay to get their private collections shown at museums? Nothing. Museums fall all over themselves to exhibit people's art collecting in hope that art will be donated to the museum. Um, plenty, but it's worth it. Uh, in 1999, the Brooklyn Museum opened a show of contemporary British art from the collection of Charles Saatchi, who secretly gave 160000 to pay for the show. Saatchi auctioned off the works by the same artist soon after the exhibit and received record prices. So they're commenting on sort of the constructs of what happens when you have NEA funding pulled and then you have um, exhibitions controlled by corporate forces like Charles Saatchi. So the Gorilla Girls have dealt with a lot of issues like this. They are a very important contemporary art group showing up in 1985 um, and dealing with how um, the sort of constructs behind the museum scene, like the selling and buying of art by corporate forces, as well as who is displayed in museums and who has the right to be displayed. Um, first starting their conversation about women and how much women aren't being um, exhibited in galleries. as well as the advantages of being a woman artist. Some of these are sort of ironic and punny and deal with all of these inherent issues. Um, if any of you did, um, I don't think anybody chose N Linda Nochlin for their theorist for Major Assignment 3, um, but this very much has to do, um, she connects with this article in many ways. Not having to be in shows with men, um, seeing your ideas leave on the work of others, um, having the opportunity to choose between career and motherhood, um, being included in revised versions of art history. Um, where is my favorite one about genius? Being reassured that whatever kind of art you make is labeled feminine. Here it is. Not having to undergo the embarrassment of being called a genius. So again, very much playing with satire and comedy in their works and posters. Like Pop Quiz, if February is Black History Month and March is Women's History Month, what happens the rest of the year? Discrimination. 
They also work in um, sort of historic images like of Aang's La Grande Odalisque into their work and do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Less than 5% of artists in the modern art sections are women but 85% of the nudes are female. Um, and they've done this over the years and seen that it hasn't really changed all that much from 89 to 2012. They've also used um, works like Marette Oppenheim's Object and some of their protest works as well. Um, this is a postcard they sent uh, to MoMA. And they've played with some of different constructs in their own sort of performances of self in that they've dressed up like gorillas and taken on the names of historic artists, um, female artists like Lee Krasner, um, Eva Hesse, Hannah Hawk, Frida Kahlo, etc. And then playing with some of these constructs of femininity and sexuality in their clothing as well. Sometimes wearing like black and um, dresses and painting their nails and having lipstick on their gorilla masks, um, etc. So dealing with some of these interesting constructs of femininity and um, museum censorship. As you can imagine, commercialization plays a big part um, in what we are talking about with Charles Saatchi and the sensation exhibit because we have a lot of blurring of lines between art and other categories of culture like high and low art. And you have like Clement Greenberg writing um, his article on kitsch, right? Kitsch starts to become part of art and culture and um, sort of thinking about commercialized products as culture as well. So. Jeff Koons is definitely a big figure in the sort of commercialized artistic world. We talked about him with Richard Hamilton and his collage, right, of these vacuums, the Hoover. Um, he's very well known for taking kitsch items and making them sort of like highly craft luxury objects for wealthy collectors. He kind of appears to warmly embrace our consumer lifestyle, while at the same time coolly appraising the shallowness of a civilization devoid of deeper meaning. It's kind of ironic that his work critiques commercialization while also utilizing it to make him sort of a millionaire slash billionaire. So just like Damien Hirst, just like these other artists or um, John Curran, we start to kind of question um, what these ideas and constructions um, of critiquing those ideas actually mean when you're utilizing them to create your own wealth, right? So Jeff Koons has done this with a lot of his work. Um, a lot of people also critique him because he doesn't actually create any of his works. He's just the designer and they go out to a factory or an artistic group that produces them for him. So he makes these consumer goods that he does not individually produce and then sells them for millions of dollars with his name stamped on them, right? So his balloon works are very well known. Um, he became also well known when he did the banality works, um, which are sort of was like an exhibition of kitsch items in porcelain um, and other different objects like he sold plates um, and sculptures as well. So taking um, kind of these unoriginal ideas of kitsch and like, you know, things that your grandma would have on her shelves, right? Like porcelain uh, bears and kids with pigs and stuff like that and sort of turning it and subverting it and thinking about it um, in sort of the artistic world itself. So the Michael Jackson and Bubbles is a big work from that series from 1988. This is one of the big productions. This one is about life size, I think. Um, but again, you could also buy a plate. <laughs> um, and he's definitely playing with some interesting ideas in that um, he's repeating Michael Jackson's image, who was uh, popular in the 80s and obviously 90s, but maybe not so highly looked at today. Um, Cam... Coons capitalized on artifice, artifice presenting objects that, while they reveal something of the fixation on American culture, suggested that desires responsible for creating Michael Jackson and Bubbles are simulated and correspond to nothing more than real television. Um, and they're also kind of funny and weird, right? Like, who would want to buy a massive kitsch statue of Michael Jackson and Bubbles? Um... But then if you frame it as this sort of well-known artistic piece by a famous artist, does it then become more interesting, more valuable? Even though it's like super ugly, right? Um, Jeff Koons has done a lot of things to play with kind of commercialization and um, encouraging his own sort of artistic name. 
in different ways. So this is his Made in Heaven series that he does um, with his porn star wife, um, Ileona Stoller, also known as Chicolina, who they married, um, he married. They both came together and produced a series of photographs, sculptures, objects, again, that he could sell, um, all with them having sex together. So some of the photographs are quite unexplicit, while others are very explicit, um, sh showcasing various sex acts between the two. Um, but again, this work has to do with a lot of commercialization and producing these kitsch objects. So he does this really weird but interesting kind of photographic series where he's having sex with his wife and they're very sort of fantastical and weird with butterflies, but then produces all of these massive sculptures and small trinkets you could buy. I mean, like, how creepy are you, right? Like, I, it gives you some weird feelings, right, that you could buy um, these a tiny... Um, but expensive glass tchotchke of Jeff Koons having sex with his wife. So playing with these constructs of commercialization in his work, um, which then makes him an inherently sort of rich and well-known artist. Um, this work is at the Chicago Art Institute, if you've seen it. And like even this, it's super gorgeous. It's made out of marble. It sparkles. But um, he didn't produce it, right? He's not a hand carver. He didn't hand carve this bust out of marble, right? Some other artist did, and it's just his idea, his design, um, his body in marble. Um, he also recently did a um, collaboration with Louis Vuitton and produced um, purses, so putting famous artist names on them with their works um, and his little balloon um, rabbit. Um, as well as having Louis Vuitton symbol on here as well, and producing series. So making work that's more quote-unquote for the everyday individual, right? Because I'm sure all of us can purchase thousands of dollar purses um, made by Jeff Koons and Louis Vuitton. Um, but again, sort of dealing with commodification in a different way. There are other artists like Jenny Holzer who play with this as well, with her truisms from 1978. Kind of similar to thinking about um, like we pasting up posters by the Gorilla Girls. Um, she put up these posters around New York City that um, were based on pithy and political, sometimes cryptic sayings that she composed and post on the streets of New York, creates language works um, that appropriate the anonymous, often aggressive manner in which messages of warning or instructions are transmitted from institutions such as police forces, the military, schools, or churches. So she starts creating these kind of weird comic um, but sometimes sad and aggressive stating state statements to kind of make people think, to um, encourage a response one way or another. And so a lot of them don't make sense, and some of them do, but I mean, like, what are they referencing? So, like, a lot of professionals are crackpots, a strong sense of duty imprisons you, abstraction is a type of decadence, abuse of power should come as no surprise, artificial desires are despoiling the earth, being sure of yourself means you're a fool, enjoy yourself because you can't change anything anyway. So she wants to kind of provoke insightful conversation as well as trying to call out social injustices and ideas like men don't protect you anymore and putting it on condoms, um, raise boys and girls the same way, protect me from what I want. Um, this is Lady Pink, who's a street artist, um, wearing abuse of power comes as no surprise. So playing with some of these ideas um, and constructs that advertising and commercials use to draw you in, to get you to buy something, um, instead sort of using them to subvert those ideas. Now, appropriation is kind of a part of this commercialization because a lot of artists started playing with appropriation um, in the 70s and 80s, and it's the tactful borrowing and recontextualization of existing images was one of the first identifying characteristics of an art that would be called postmodern. You have um, photography of photographs, so people taking pictures of pictures, pictures of TV, pictures of fi films, um, to startle viewers of the late 1970s, appropriation appeared to a mean-spirited plagiarism that undermined the intuitive experience of looking at art. However, these artists changing the appropriation and making bold statements through their use and reuse, kind of like sampling music. 
Appropriation turned out to be an effective strategy for dealing with the power of mass media and even stealing its thunder, and it was destructive in setting or deconstructive, that is, in setting in motion an analytical process that takes apart and exposes the image maker's design on us and how we can be manipulated by images. So taking images and rethinking them, recontextualizing them to show um, how media is manipulating individuals or people in particular ways. So you can think definitely think about Barbara Kruger as one of these authors um, and artists, although they aren't like inherently appropriation in the fact that they don't necessarily um, evoke images that you may be familiar with, like this hand is not going to be something that you know or where it's from, but she's taking the ideas of magazine layouts of consumerism, um, which is a field that she worked in early in her life before she became an artist um, or a well-known artist that is. And sort of taking the ideas that this advertisement, advertisement and magazines were using and reutilized it um, to talk about the control of women's bodies, um, undertones of oppression, um, of consumerism, and um, playing with these sort of ideas. So I shop, therefore I am. Money can buy you love. Know nothing, believe anything, forget everything. Your gaze hits the side of my face. This one very much deals with sort of the female gaze and um, staring at women. And your body is a battleground. Um, this is probably one of her most famous works. She made this as a poster um, in 1989 for the Women's March on Washington to support legal abortion. And it became a poster that everyone carried around. So she's very much sort of dealing with a lot of these oppressive ideas about women in the media and sort of reconstructing them and recontextualizing them. So I'm legit staring at the next screen, which is this one, um, trying to figure out why that looks wrong. Um, I spelled identity wrong in my description of identity. Um, in the next like blip, you'll see it. Um, but it'll look like this. <laughs> so, um, just so you're aware, I live my life. Identity, as you can imagine, is a big part of contemporary art and when I frame these couple of artists that I have under identity, know that you can really think about almost any um, type of art in identity, right? In the identity of the artist or other individuals. Because identity is very broad, right? It's the fact of being who you are, what a person is, distinguishing character or personality of an individual. Is identity biological or socially determined by life experiences or outside influences? And then how much do we have control over um, ourselves and the performance of self very much connecting to performance art and the performance of gender so for example Cindy Sherman is really a famous artist for this in her untitled film stills so she created sort of these images and this is her most famous work in which she turned the camera on herself which she's been doing um, basically her whole life now with her artistic career and using herself as a vehicle to connect on social issues, often sort of connecting with the role of women. Um, so she takes sort of props and lining and makeup and creates these images um, that play with some different ideas and constructs. So like this one in particular, in which she pretends to be different um, quote unquote types of women and creates these sort of self portraits. So um, Sherman plays a type, not an actual person, but a self-fabricated fabricated fictional one. There is an archetypal housewife, the prostitute, the woman in distress, um, a woman in tears, the dancer, the actress, the malleable chameleon-like Sherman plays in all these characters, a hybrid of photography and performance art that reveals that femininity is to be an effective representation. So. In looking at these types of images, she's rethinking the gaze, rethinking how she as a woman can perform all of these types of what it means to be a woman, and thus plays with the value of the belief in those constructs, right? The belief that a woman has to be a housewife, that she has to be sexy, that she has to be an actress, that she has to be this and that and this. And so she's again continuing to think about the gaze, the female gaze, and how um, men sort of... Um, have this way of looking and looking at women. Um, the act of observation as it is implicated in power relations between those who observe and those who are observed. 
She plays with this as well in things like her um, history paintings in which she explores um, culture at the intersection between social and psychological, kind of playing with some weird ideas in that like she's taking these historic paintings, not all of them reference specific paintings, but taking historic paintings in general and rethinking them and making them kind of weird and creepy um, and sort of rethinking these cultural constructs of art and masterpieces um, and cast herself in sort of these archetypal paintings that are kind of um, weird, make you feel weird, right, and off. Um, some of the paintings she is doing is are very reminiscent of particular works like um, Bacchus by uh, Caravaggio. as well as lactating Madonna figures, um, this one by Da Vinci, where yes, in fact, um, there was a great desire for lactating Madonna portraits that were put um, in women's quarters um, to help them with breastfeeding and that sort of thing. So um, although she sort of lived abroad and played with these ideas of masterpieces, um, she said, even when I was doing those history pictures, I was living in Rome, but never went to the churches and museums there. I worked out of books with reproductions. It's an aspect of photograph I appreciate conceptually the idea that images can be reproduced and seen anytime, anywhere by anyone. And she's played with a lot of different things in her work, and I can't show you um, nearly as many as I would like to, but she's played with types and the construction of types. So in Metro Pictures in 2008, she plays with like Vampy versus Secretary, right? Like the country Southern Belle or like the sort of dark um, heiress or something like that, right? Playing with these types of people. And then her most recent series has kind of went into investigating um, what aging means to women and looking at aging starlets of like the 20s. So thinking about the movie like Sunset Boulevard, you have these aging 1920s famous starlets um, and what it means for them to age and sort of grow, quote unquote, like undesirable, right? Um, even though they're famous and gorgeous, they're not sort of sexual objects anymore. Here is um, work by Carrie Mae Weems, who's also very much dealing with identity and specifically black identity. Um, she does this by showing stages and um, sort of sets of who she is as an individual through photographs at her kitchen table. So she sets up her kitchen table as the kind of set and all of the events happen here um, in which it shows sort of different roles um, of her as an individual. So like for example, um, being a wife or being a lover being lonely, um, connection with her friends, connection with her daughter, and with her physical self. So really, as she sets herself out to be the protagonist in all of these photographs, she has different people around her revealing different um, ideas. Um, it is not a portrait, instead, um, women identity is shaped by many variables, including her gender, her status as a working class black American, her relationships with other people, and her social history. You can also think of this very much in the context of Amy Sherald's work, who is also representing black figures. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of them here in a row. Um, Amy Sherald, who is well known for painting the new portrait of the first lady in 2018 um but as she has sort of talked about um how she represents race and how she constructs identity through race and what she really focuses on in her works is the color of skin so she was born in georgia and remember sort of not having a lot of interaction with black individuals and she wanted to rethink blackness later in life um, through the exclusion of color. So she paints all these portraits where these figures have really vibrant clothes and really vibrant backgrounds and evoke this kind of sense of timeless identity while also kind of muting the skin color. So in doing this, she's making a very intentional move towards kind of um, somehow de-emphasizing and emphasizing it at the same time, right? So thinking about different constructs of race and color and what that means to each individual person and how that then constructs 
um, their own personal identity as a figure, right? So making them almost gray um, compared to all the other um, colors in the images. Carrie James Marshall is another figure who's very interested in skin color, um, opposite of Amy Sherald. He goes to painting the skin um, very, very dark, so overemphasizing skin color in darkness to emphasize blackness of figures. So you can see that in his work like Pastimes. Um, this might feel a little familiar, but it's definitely because it's definitely like an urban pastoral scene featuring black figures in golf, in in engaged in golf croquet, water skiing, and boating, along with um, the lyrics of Snoop Dogg and um, By the Temptations floating above them and here from the boom boxes. And it's very interesting to look at this image and to connect it with um, images that we've seen um, of this type of scene. Uh, this is a study for this work. Um, but it's very much in connection. He's making a connection historically with images like um, Surratt's Sunday on La Grande Jatte or um, Luxury Calm um, from Matisse in that he's thinking about this dialogue of placing black figures in these same kind of scenes and then recontextualizing it, rethinking it in this type of image. It, um, looks more like this image of upper class pastoral activity than it does of like Chicago urban landscape. And it's kind of like connecting those ideas together. You can think about that further with Gehinda Wiley. As we talked about him in this class and his connection with the Tahitian portraiture of Paul Gauguin, you have Gehinda Wiley rethinking um, quite often the representation of black figures in art historically. So, and he has done that with numerous types of art, such as his equestrian series. So for example, um, placing black figures in these paintings that already exist um, in these large scale, they're quite large and massive, just as big as sort of the originals and showing the power of the black figure being put in the gallery space that they have, um, not existed in for such a long amount of time, specifically historically. So you can of course see that with Ice-T here and Napoleon. And he goes through producing this work in different series. Um, he has quite a few of them, some of them involving women and not. The Economy of Grace um, involves women. I'm just going to show you one of those, but these are from Blacklight. Um, and you can see he takes, he often takes black men off the streets um, and poses them and takes photographs of them and then paints these large scale paintings with these highly decorative landscapes. Um, he has done that a little differently depending um, on the work, but this was sort of his traditional way of doing it originally, and then kind of posing them in these classical poses. And it also emphasized kind of the fashion of those individuals, right? He is emphasizing the color and the beauty of what each individual is wearing and probably chose them for some of their fashion um, choices that make them stand out as individuals. And then you can see how greatly he paints them and how they connect with Gehinda Wiley and the work. Um, I mean, like his his gaze always really gets me every time I see it and how much he seems to be connecting with um, Gehinda Wiley as an artist. And again, like I said, Economy of Grace was done um, like this as well, but they're a little different in that um, he gets dresses designed and hair done um, and poses them in sort of classical um, poses, um, it sort of sets it up a little more, um, specifically than the other works. Okay, moving right along, hopefully you're not too overwhelmed. Um, the body is another big theme, um, as well in contemporary art, and of course this connects additionally to identity, to other constructs that we've looked at. Um, the body as part of social meaning, thinness is prized, um, value in women's bodies and strength and size important in male bodies. Bodily shine, signs show if figure is male or female and the performance of gender and how you move your body. 
So a big figure in that is Nick Cave, who has worked in sound suits for some time. Um, he finally he just recently kind of ended it, um, but he continues to do some of this work in which he worked with a lot of found objects due to his lack of resources living in Missouri and being raised by a single mother, and then started to create sort of these costumes, these suits that could be worn and could be danced in and performed. So kind of transforming um, these objects. And what he says about them is that they sort of erase boundaries, erase differences, in that bringing people together to dance in these suits kind of erases their identity, their race, their gender, and just brings people together to really be involved and engaged in something like dance in connection in performance. So he's dealt with some of these constructs of race before, such as the first suit he made in 92 in response to the Rodney King riots and beating. Um, he had some connection and feeling that this could have been him too. And he saw a twig on the ground, which was something that um, is dismissed and walked upon. And so he wanted to make something um, powerful and strong, and that would create sound so that it would get him kind of a notice as a part of this protest of what had happened. And so he created his first sound suit through using innumerable sticks to create this suit that in, you can imagine like swooshing right back and forth and it like clicking. Um, in using an object that he felt had no power in reinvigorating it. So it's really great and interesting to look at these suits. Um, they kind of stand not only as sort of aesthetic objects on their own, that you could look at them and say that they're aesthetically interesting and pleasing, um, but I have also included some videos on um, the link pages or um, below the YouTube video here to make sure that you're watching them because really where you're going to get your understanding of where these sound suits are going, what Nick Cave is trying to say is looking at um, people actually performing in them. To upload those so that you see the links that you can watch some of these sound suits in action as well. Again, you can think about the body in a lot of different ways. Um, I have the figure here of Lorna Simpson, who sort of works with photography and kind of trying to represent her body and the idea um, of gender performance. Um, so, for example, um, this is a set of images called Stereo Styles, in which 10 individuals of the back of women's heads with different hairstyles that were popular at the time. Um, and describing them as dare, daring, sensible, long and silky, boyish, ageless, silly, magnetic, fresh, sweet. So um, there are a lot of different connections between um, women's identity and their hair, um, specifically involving African American and Black women and how they represent their hair, um, whether or not it's straight or left natural. Um, etc. And so Lorna Simpson is playing with this construct in photographing just hair and thinking about um, the hair of individuals and what that means to their identity and likely what that means to then her as an individual. And then you can see her taking that farther in some of maybe her darker works like something like Untitled uh, Two Necklines from 1989. Um, in which she is discussing sort of the tragic events of lynching on um, black figures and what that means. So these two circular photographs um, showing black women's chin, mouth, neck, and collarbone, and the text next to the rings um, of her face saying ring, surround, lasso, noose, eye, areola, halo, cuffs, collar, loop feel the ground sliding from under you so connecting being confronting about this sort of connection between black bodies and the action that was done against them in the past um, and how they connect with that um, as artists and how she connects with her past as well Lorna Simpson's work very much feeds into the theme of memory um, and how you understand and think about memory. Um, history is never really impartial. You have to remember history is written by the winners, the saying goes, and the winners commissioned art that focus on the stories they preferred. Motivation to recover neglected or forgotten histories of women, ethnic minor minorities, and other marginalized groups. No one historic truth or grand narrative. 
artists often memorializing people who came before them or memorializing people who they feel have been not represented fully um, in art. Much art focuses on memory is narrative and form, creating myths, religious stories, epic literary tales, and accounts for life-changing historical events such as wars, epidemics, and natural disasters. So the first artist we're going to talk about is Cornelia Parker. She very much works with found objects involving sort of history, memory, emotion, and new or events, events, sculptures that are constantly unstable, in flux, might collapse. Um, I found her works very interesting and I've sort of grown to like them more as of recently as she sort of started to deal with kind of these weird and interesting um, works that I never really connected with before. Um, but in her works, such as 30 Pieces of Silver, she'll do things like flatten silver objects, including plates, spoons, candlesticks, trophies, cigarette cases, teapots, and trombones. She ceremonially, ceremonially crushes them with a steamroller, arranges them in different kind of shapes, um, and refers to sort of historic tradition of these things. So, like, when you look at them... They're obviously very gorgeous and interesting, but why? Um, she's very much obviously reflecting on kind of the value and the history of these objects themselves in that they probably have a lot of history history, and she's kind of crushed them and made them um, unusable. But also she always sort of con connects her work with something more tangible, like thinking about well, who, what does 30 pieces of silver mean? Um, it's definitely referring to the biblical story of how Judas betrayed Jesus. He received 30 pieces of silver and connecting that with this idea of history, objects, um, worth, the past, all these really weird um, connecting ideas in something that like is really sort of gorgeous and interesting. Um, it makes you kind of think about these objects um, very differently, especially when they're flattened, right? And they kind of look like paper. Um, and are sort of completely devoid of use. She does this with other works like Cold Dark Matter, an exploded view in which she suspended remnants of a destroyed building from a gallery ceiling by one strand. And she did this, um, she took a building and exploded it and then tried to rebuild it. So like a little shack um, and sort of builds these pieces as though they were currently exploding, right? So thinking about the history of a space and then its destruction and sort of photographing in some capacity, right, that destruction, but in a sculptural form. It's really sort of crazy, right, to think about literally trying to capture a moment of destruction and memory in a sculpture. She gets even totally weirder with her work Shared Fate. Um, in this work, she literally borrowed the actual guillotine that was used to behead Marie Antoinette in, 19, in 1793 and used it to break things apart. What a weird thing to do, right? But in doing this, she takes these objects and creates a shared fate, right? Now not only have these objects been cut in half by a guillotine, they are also now connected inherently with Marie Antoinette and her beheading as an individual, right? Connecting these um, objects together. Also, in doing research for this work, I found that you can go to Madame Tussauds in London and see the decapitated heads in wax, right? So not the real heads of people, um, but the wax um, heads of Marie Antoinette and Louis the Sixteenth. Um, after their beheading, like what a weird thing for Madame Tussauds to make. I was totally um, weirded out by the whole thing. There are a lot of artists that play with this idea. Um, Kusama is one of them as well in her works dealing with memory. Um, she has been involved in a lot of different types of art making and image making. Um, a lot of them revolving around performances. So she's a Japanese artist who has worked in sculpture and installation, but also performance, fill, and fashion. And she came out of Japan and really sort of started playing with things in New York City in the United States. So in this per particular work, she was counteracting violence um, with this protest at the New York Stock Exchange of the Vietnam War. Um, she released different press um, statements as well as these figures standing nude in front of um, 
the New York Stock Exchange, um, saying money made with the stock is enabling the war to continue. We protest this cool, greedy instrument of the war establishment. She also went on to do other pieces like walking piece uh, in which she walked around um, New York City as sort of a traditional Japanese figure, trying to think of herself as an alien in the presence of a Western metropolis and how people sort of view and think about Japanese women and the stereotypes um, that are inherently linked to them. The work that she's really well known for that comes kind of later um, here is in starts around in 1965 with her in first Infinity Mirror Room, in which she starts kind of working with these ideas of um, transcendence and these visions that she's having. She had a lot of troubles of, as a child, and her father was a womanizer, and her mother would send um, her off to watch um, her father and see what he was doing. So she kind of had this lifelong contempt for sexuality and the phallic form. And so she had some connections with fear and sexuality, like maybe think about Dali. Um, and so she wanted to represent that in her works. And she's dealt a lot with mental illness um, on her own as well. And so a lot of the works come out of those ideas and feelings. Um, she currently lives in an insane asylum in Japan, um, which she stays at um, willingly and then travels to her studio across the street and then paints all day and then goes back. Um, but she said... I don't like sex. I had an obsession with sex when I, <coughs> excuse me, when I was a child, my father had lovers and I experienced seeing him. My mother sent me to spy on him. I didn't want to have sex with anyone for years. The sexual obsession and fear of sex sit side by side in me. So she created sort of different rooms and infinity rooms that were filled with different phallic forms. She would create chairs. Um, or rooms that were completely covered in this phallic form. And she ended up finding that um, it was kind of too crazy and work intensive for her to do this. It wasn't a feasible thing for her to be able to do all the time. And so she kind of moved into using mirrors as a way to reflect this idea without her having to create sort of infinite um, phallic images, right? And so she started creating and using infinity rooms and obliteration rooms. So this one, for example, using her polka dot form that she's well known for and having an entire group of audience members um, over time come and play stickers anywhere in the room that they want to, um, but also taking spaces like mirrored gallery spaces and having lights and images that make you reflect and think back into space sort of um, infinitely. So she has dealt with kind of having these hallucinations and connecting with these ideas of self-obliteration um, and um, kind of weird transcendence. So it's really interesting to think about her kind of mental health and her mental images being projected into um, these types of images in um, galleries as well. Man is another famous photographer um, that kind of very much connects with memory and sort of in a dark and weird and interesting way. Um, she became very well known for this series called Immediate Family, um, which were photographs of her children as they grew up. And there was a lot of controversy about these works because people felt very much that she was kind of exploiting her children, kind of focusing on um, their sexuality and that she was photographing them nude or that um, potentially the children were being abused or forced to do that, or maybe this was child pornography, um, or that some of the images seemed to hint at the fact that these children could have been abused or that they were being molested. So it became this very controversial series, but um, as Sally Mann has talked about it, um, most people do believe that the work um, she's been sort of reviewed by psychologists. She had a court case. She never had her children taken away from her. She's continued to be the sort of this famous photographer. And people really have sort of rethought, um, who is this woman? What is she doing? And really what it comes down to is that 
she was a woman photographing her children playing in their yard in the country at their house they spent time naked it was sort of who they were the children that is not the parents necessarily um but just photograph them being playful being silly um and yes some of them are more posed than others in that like she asked them to pose a particular way or not um but it really sort of gives you this really interesting and sort of gore i mean they're intensely gorgeous images of sort of sally man's family um and what she experienced with her children as they were young um she's also gone on to photograph her husband who's now um currently dying of um i believe he has like a degenerative disease but it's so interesting to see her life has unfolded because now um her son um he committed suicide recently um, as well. So to see how sort of her life and family has evolved over time, this sort of tragic history of um, her photographing her children, um, even though there never came out to be any sort of um, inherently evil reason for her photographing them. Karen Walker is another famous artist that's dealt with memory. Um, you're probably familiar with her in some capacity as she's pretty controversial and well known for her black paper silhouettes, um, usually used um, to portray these sort of scenes of the South in the past um, of the the conflict between black and white figures. And she wanted to use black silhouettes because they're usually used for genteel portraits and sentimental genre scenes. I don't know if you were ever, um, if your parents ever had you do that thing where they cast the shadow on you to get your silhouette um, drawn and cut out of paper and it, you would have a silhouette in your room or whatever. I don't know if that's a thing anymore that people do. Good Lord. Um, but taking this and using it to talk about stereotypes in the South, in the past, um, and sort of kitsch parodies and racist imagery. So you'll see like on this um, particular series that's based on Gone with the Wind. You have some of these figures um, and you can usually tell pretty clearly who is white or black based upon their facial features. So these are white figures, these are black figures. Um, and it starts to seem sort of normal or like a story you're supposed to be reading. But you start to notice sort of all of these dark and twisted details. Um, for example, you can see that there is somebody else's feet um, inside of this girl's dress. Or that you have um, oral sex being done on a young boy between a young boy and a young girl in sort of these rape stories um, of the past in the South. Um, and some of that loss of innocence um, and some of these dark images. So um, really sort of engaging with these really awful and um, sort of dark stereotypes that Kara Walker has worked with in her work. One of her recent works from 2014 is a subtlety. Um, moving away from the recent, a lot of her work is um, these cutout silhouettes and paper silhouettes and some of these drawings that relate to it. But she did this large piece of installation, which I think has a lot of power and interest. Um, its full name is A Subtlety or The Marvelous Sugar Baby, a homage to the unpaid and overworked artisans who have refined our sweet tastes from the cane fields to the kitchens of the New World on the occasion of the demolition of the Domino Sugar Refinement Plant. So Kara Walker was able to get a hold um, of this Domino Sugar Refinery to hold an exhibition before it was demolished. And um, at this factory in New York, she put on this large um, exhibition that had to do with um, the industrial past and thinking about it as a whole and also that um, historic connection between black figures and the production of sugar and slavery. So the sugar factory was such a phenomenal place to produce this work because this place is riddled with kind of this history of the past. Um, when you go into this Domino Sugar Refinery room that she has her exhibition in, um, people said that the walls are just like caked in sugar and syrup and you can smell it um, in the building as a whole. It's kind of caked in it. And in the center of this room um, is a large sugar baby or um, kind of mammy figure, um, which is very much connecting not only to the figures who were enslaved and worked hard to produce the sugar for middle class white individuals, but also is very much in the shape of a sphinx, which connects with sort of Egyptian power um, and 
sort of the prowess of that figure and the power that she has. And also even in the size, right? In doing this gigantic size of this figure shows such an intense power um, as an individual. There was also little figures that accompanied this installation as well. Um, little sort of um, children carrying baskets that were also made out of sugar. And what's also interesting about these is that the space was so hot and humid that they began to dissolve and disintegrate and almost became part of um, the sculpture and idea itself in that sort of disintegrating and slowly being destroyed kind of fed into um, all these sort of dark ideas that are represented in this work. Now, something that came out of this work in talking about Kara Walker's of subtlety is the way that people kind of reacted to this work, which is some people felt awe and felt connected, but somehow with this work, you know, being out of the museum space um, and being this massive black female figure with big tits, with a big vagina, people felt that they could objectify this work. So it became very popular on Instagram for people to post pictures that were sexually explicit, that um, played with her vagina and her sexual um, body parts. And so it became this huge conversation about not only how you treat art and the way that people talk about these sort of really tragic historic moments, but how then you react negatively and objectify a black woman by her body, right, by her big butt, her big boobs, um, continuing to sort of encourage these stereotypes, which is insane. So here you have that Carol Walker makes this work to talk about these issues and then they happen right in the gallery space. So people were so offended um, and it really changed people's way of thinking about this work that people even objectified this sugar figure that was placed in sort of such high regard and prowess as this kind of sphinx finger figure. I Alrighty, so next week is the final exam. I'll be uploading all the pertinent information here very shortly. I'm just collecting it all together, and then um, I will see everyone next week to review, uh, and then have the online exam similar to the midterm. Um, so thanks, guys.